Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Virginia Robert, and I'm a reporter for Les Echo. It's the French Business Daily. Uh, today, we're here to talk about the main challenges of the global economy. And uh, here are words that we thought we would never hear again, or almost hardly ever, like isolationism or protectionism. In its latest uh, World Economic Outlook, uh, the IMF chief economist, uh, Maurice Oxfeld, warned that turning back the clock on trade can only deepen and prolong the world, the world economy's current doldrums. Yet, we see less and less support for trade agreement in the United States as in Europe. And meanwhile, the pace of exchange is slowing down. It will be a mere 1.7% this year, half of what it was in 2015. Worse, its growth will be inferior to the one of the world economy that is expected at 2.2% in 2016. In addition, as you well, very well know, geopolitical, geopolitical factors are bringing much instability. President-elect Trump, for instance, brings a whole new level of uncertainties, as, as did the Brexit earlier last summer. Add to this the refugee crisis, and we now wonder if there is a real threat of deconstructing Europe even more so if populist leaders find their way in the upcoming elections. The central banks, although keen on giving their support, will be slowly tightening their policies. The Fed, as you know, should probably raise interest rates as early as December, and it's almost the end of free money. In Europe, the Commission has given a little bit of leeway to the states so they can add more stimulus, but will that be enough? As you perhaps know, uh, income per capita in Europe is still beyond its pre-crisis level. And in Asia, the situation is not very glorious either. China's growth is slowing, and that impacts the whole region, if not the whole world. So to discuss the main challenges of the worldwide economy, we have today with us Mr. Bark, who is professor at Seoul National University and was former Minister of Trade at uh, the Republic of Korea. Uh, Monsieur Jean-Claude Trichet, who used to be uh, the former president of the European Central Bank. John Lipsky, uh, former first deputy managing editor of the IMF and also at John Hopkins University nowadays. And Mr. Chow, uh, who is vice president and secretary general at the Shanghai Development Research Foundation. So we're going to start right away. So to, to stay in the news, because we like that uh, in the newspapers, uh, there was a little video somebody talked to me about this morning. Uh, we're talking with John Lipsky. I don't know if you had a chance to see it. It's two point, uh, a little over two minutes. And uh, Donald Trump gave uh, his, uh, uh, what is it, his line, his directions for the, his upcoming presidency. Um, we wonder really what are going to be the effect of a Trump presidency on the global economy. John, we were discussing that earlier. Can you give us a hint of what the president-elect said this morning? Yes, uh, thank you, Virginie. Uh, thanks to the organizers for, for the invitation to be here. The, um, uh, Mr. Trump's uh, video address uh, suggested one. It was released through YouTube, uh, indicating that we will we will be receiving presidential uh, information through non-standard or through, through alternative media from now on between Twitter and YouTube. The, uh, the idea uh, was to announce the actions that he was going to, planning to take on day one of his presidency. And uh, one of those items was to notify the withdrawal from the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. Uh, he also said that in the few, he put this in the context of saying that the principle will be America first and a goal of bringing essentially manufacturing, he mentioned autos and high tech, uh, back, he said, to the U.S., which is a little uh, uncertain but a slight, slight ominous tone uh, because that may hint at protection. And he said that henceforth he would uh, f focus on bilateral trade deals which adds a new, uh, a new complexity. Uh, he announced some other things, a two-for-one regulatory program in which every new regulation promulgated would have to be accompanied by the extinction of two 
prior existing regulations uh, and some, some other measures. But uh, let me just say that the, uh, in addition to his pronouncements, it's clear that financial markets participants have made some assumptions about the effect of, of uh, uh, Mr. Trump's plans, uh, President Trump's plans on the economy. Uh, there has been a reiteration of the intention to, uh, inst to begin a very large scale infrastructure pro uh, program, although with no details are yet available. But markets seem to assume that there will be, uh, along with tax cuts, I should say, infrastructure spending and tax cuts, markets have concluded, at least to some degree, that U.S. fiscal policy will turn in a more expansionary direction at a time in which it's possible that the economy is approaching full capacity, at least in many areas. And as a result, uh, the outlook for both Fed policy and long-term interest rates, not just, not just short-term interest rates, has become much more uncertain. If we quickly go around, do you have you know, any gut feeling of what this means for the global economy? Mr. Barr? I think uh, I'm the only trade uh, expert. Uh, other panelists are more in uh, finance. But uh, we thought uh, TPP, the conclusion of TPP, was a very welcome news to the world trading environment because uh, nothing is going well these days. Multilateral front, uh, you know, Doha round is failing actually uh, after you know 15 years of negotiations going nowhere and the other mega RTAs so-called uh, uh, Korea China CJK trilateral FTA negotiations and the RCEP negotiations and TTIP they have been moving okay but very slowly without much progress so we thought maybe TPP will be a kind of epoch making event uh, which can uh, you know, uh, push for other uh, uh, negotiations. But uh, since uh, the day one, uh, you know, Trump uh, already said that uh, he will, the U.S. will withdraw from the TPP, which is adding uh, very much you know, uncertainty and uh, unpredictability to the world trading system. Because right now, current state of the world trading system is facing tremendous challenges and most difficult challenges since uh, the establishment of multilateral trading system in 1948. So as a trade economist, we are really concerned. And on top of that, uh, he mentioned uh, he will do many, many, you know, protectionist kind of uh, policy measures in the future. So, um, you know, it uh, really hurt the current uh, state. So I don't know uh, whether really, uh, even though he said that he will withdraw uh, 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 from TPP, uh, I think t if you look at TPP, I mean, uh, it's originally wanted to give some pressure to uh, China. So I think it's in line with uh, Trump's, you know, remarks on negative things about uh, China. So maybe he will change his mind, I, I hope. But uh, it may take uh, quite some time through renegotiation and other things. So I, I think this is really uh, bad. <laughs> yeah. At the Very same time, I would react on China right away, if you don't mind, Mr. Chow because there was this APEC meeting uh, earlier, and apparently to the Chinese who were not included in the TPP, they find here a lot of new opportunities for them that they would like to size. Uh, I, I would say yes. The Chinese government, the, the position of Chinese government toward TPP have kind of a little bit of change. Uh, from two or three years ago, uh, Chinese government uh, have a strong against uh, TPP, uh, thinking the TPP targeting uh, against China. But in past one or two years, they just say we open uh, to see what happened. Of course, it now it's given more opportunity for Chinese government to carry uh, other program like uh, RCEP, I guess uh, mm -hmm. some countries have already expressed interest in negotiation on another program. Uh, that's uh, something I'm thinking. At the same time, it's probably going to be a tough uh, bargaining because you see opportunities on the trade side. At the same time, he said he would raise tariffs incredibly mm. high on China. So mm. I guess there, there's a lot of uh, bargaining space there. Yeah. 
uh, I'm not sure finally whether uh, new administration of the United States really will have a, a high tariff on Chinese export. Mm -hmm. If uh, President Trump did that, I guess China will bring the case to WTO. At the same time, we'll take uh, action, uh, retaliate against the uh, US. Mm -hmm. The results will be disorder of, of a whole world mm -hmm. uh, trade whole world economy. So there would be a very strong reaction into sure. the multiple instances. Yeah. yeah. Do, do you think we're going toward trade wars? We learned uh, the lesson from the past uh, <laughs> in the, uh, near the Second World War to avoid this kind of trade war we had before. That's why we established multilateral trade negotiation, I mean, multilateral trading system. But, uh, uh, if things are going like this, retaliation after retaliation by big, you know, big players, then maybe we are virtually entering into a, uh, some kind of trade war, which we should avoid. So maybe, maybe uh, through this kind of conference, we should give some suggestions to the leaders, or the leaders, you know, not to have this kind of situation. Yes, it, it seems that we wouldn't want to be premature in, in uh, concluding what is really going to happen here. Uh, Mr. Trump is a negotiator, so this is a, an opening position. And I noticed, I, I believe, uh, Prime Minister Abe has already responded by saying that Japan would not be interested in going forward at this time with TPP without U.S. participation, which was an, interpreted as a, uh, he, that the, at least the Japanese authorities want to wait and see what Mr. Trump's in, real intentions are in the longer term. You would hope that uh, the, the dangers of active uh, uh, protectionist and retaliatory measures in the trade, uh, trade arena, uh, that the dangers would be well understood and, and avoided, I would hope. Uh, first of all, I think that we should take very seriously, of course, what, uh, what's going on, not only in the United States, but uh, also in uh, Europe, certainly, and in other advanced economy where we have exactly the same phenomenon of uh, frustration of a large part of the working population, uh, feeling the stress of the, uh, I would say, intense uh, competition, the need for restructuring and reshaping in the productive sector, the impact of science and technology and uh, IT and the other advances, which is also calling for uh, abrupt and sharp changes. So, this frustration is expressed politically now very, very clearly. And I would interpret that as uh, something like, uh, uh, could you slow down the process of uh, uh, advances in all domain because it's, uh, it hurts us and it obliges us to change our job, accept restructuring, accept a, a lot of uh, hard thing to do, particularly when you have a low level of education and when you have a diff major difficulty to re-engineer your own skills. So that, that's the main political problem I see mm -hmm. in, in the US and uh, in the UK in a way because Brexit says the same and also uh, in continental Europe, including in our country, if I may. Mm -hmm. uh, that certainly uh, would translate in more or less blocking the uh, trade agreement that were mentioned, uh, whether it will translate in, you know, high level uh, of new tariffs, uh, uh, really protectionist measure, I would say if it goes that far, it could be extremely dangerous. Already, of course, uh, blocking the uh, trade agreement uh, has an impact on the global economy, which was uh, stressed uh, by uh, uh, the panelist, uh, which, which would be very bad, obviously. But again, uh, if we are really told in the advanced economy, not in the emerging economy, but in the advanced economy, that uh, things are going a little bit too fast, uh, then we have to take that into account. So what I would say that I hope very, very much that uh, we will not embark on you know, new explicit protectionist measures that would be extremely dangerous for global growth. I take as 
a given, unfortunately, that we will not proceed with new big trade agreements. Well, that's interesting what you're saying because uh, we, the fact that people are very afraid of the impact of globalization today makes it difficult for them to agree with those large trade agreements. The fact that we would go through more bilateral agreements, is this something, actually you can, you know, it gives you pace, the pace you're asking for uh, to negotiate things country by country. At the same time, it's complicated and, and you know, cumbersome. So do you think it's a good idea, uh, like China is probably going to do it now and, and the states are eager to do it, is, is go one country again, buy one country and forget completely about multilateral during that four-year time frame we have, uh, which is the, you know, the mandate for President Trump. What, what, yes, of course. Well, actually, uh, because the uh, multilateral setting is not moving very well, countries are responding to have more bilateral FTA. But uh, recently, we have a so-called RTA, bigger mega RTA, which consists of many countries. In other words, if you have a series of bilateral FTA, the pressure or adjustment cost or administration cost to the business people is increasing. In other words, if you have uh, one bilateral FTA, it's good to, to each other, but you are discriminating against all rest of the countries. If you had one, one more FTA, one more FTA, then marginal gain to the player is decreasing while the you know, administration cost is increasing. So that's why at some point of time, they want to have a bigger you know, RTA, which is much more efficient. But uh, you know, TPP has a very bad negative kind of uh, impression to the general public. So that's why at the moment, uh, U.S. is trying to have a more individual bilateral FTA. I don't think this is a good strategy or good direction. But at the same time, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the pace of uh, trade is really slowing. I'm not sure those big multilateral agreements would really boost them considerably, but they should bring some effect. If we don't have that, what do we have uh, to uh, dynamize our, our growth in emerging and advanced uh, economies? because uh, we can't rely on, on trade agreements anymore for at least a couple of years. So is it big infrastructure programs like Donald Trump, you know, is mentioning in the States about one billion, uh, one trillion, sorry, investment um, in Canada. They're planning, a, 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 I think it's around 120 billion uh, investment plan in infrastructure. Is this what we're gonna have to rely on to, uh, to, to give a booster to our economies? Or is there ways to improve our investments more efficiently? Because the problem is that since 2008, the pace of growth has been extremely slow. Who wants to pitch in? If I may say, say a word on that, uh, it's absolutely clear that the uh, pace of, uh, of um, the global trade has uh, slowed considerably and it is undoubtedly uh, linked to the uh, problem that we had in the advanced economy in the time of the crisis, the uh, legacy of the crisis, it's uh, also uh, clearly, clearly a, a very, very bad move. Since uh, I would like to, to ask uh, colleagues uh, whether uh, there is some merit in the explanation that in any case, the expansion of global trade, which was absolutely incredible, say in the beginning of the 2000s, uh, was a little bit linked to a profound transformation of the value chain at a global level, and uh, that perhaps uh, part of the slowing down is due to the fact that this phenomenon is itself slowing down because you cannot you know, go too far in the uh, value chain reshaping, resorting, if I may, at a global level. So there are elements that are undoubtedly very alarming in what we have observed during the recent period, and perhaps elements that we can explain. We can explain partially, perhaps, uh, what we have observed. But that does not uh, diminish in any respect the judgment that, of course, uh, uh, global trade is closely associated with global growth, and uh, the slowing down of global trade is bad, and the uh, intention of many, it seems, in the advanced economy, not only Mr. Trump, but others too, and I could see that 
again, in Europe also, where even in Germany, which is very surprising, mm -hmm. as well as in France, you had uh, an opposition to the mm -hmm. trade agreement with the US. So we, we have something which is very serious there and is bad for global growth, undoubtedly, mm -hmm. and bad for the emerging economies also. Mr. Lipsky? Yes, I'm, I'm sure uh, what Jean-Claude has said is, it has to, uh, uh, truth to it. The, clearly, the first at the, for the advanced economies, the particular problem of growth reflects the persistent weakness of business investment and a shortfall in business investment, which is linked directly to the slowing of productivity growth in the advanced economies. The, uh, in the case of uh, the European Union, it's particularly notable if we look at the IMF figures on net capital formation in the European Union since the, the global financial crisis, annual growth has been only between one and two percent. So in that context, in with the context of relatively sta uh, stable uh, labor force participation, that means how could growth be much faster than one or two percent if, if that's all that is uh, going to be happening with regard to investment and productivity growth. So the, uh, this is a, a particular problem uh, for the advanced economies and one in which there is no clear and simple explanation for why this, why this persistent weakness of, uh, of capital spending. I, I don't want to drag it out or go on, but when you think, especially in the U.S. context, outside of the uh, energy market, there have been a series of developments in the last two years that should have boosted non-oil or non-energy capital spending that has not, uh, has not produced that result. And then finally, turning to the emerging markets, I think it has to be seen. The slowing of growth means that the growth in trade or growth in exports from the emerging markets as a group is now slower than their GDP growth. In other words, international trade, which was the driver of their rapid expansion has now turned into a drag of their, on their growth. Yes, Mr. Chow. I, I, I guess I agree large scale investment in infrastructure is one of way to solve uh, low growth rate, but it's not solve all of the problem, maybe just one. You look at the experience in China, in past uh, three, four decades, Chinese government has spent quite a lot of money uh, in investment in infrastructure, which give the uh, incentive to Chinese economy. But what I try to say, the how to make investments uh, depend different environments in different countries uh, with different development stage. Here I want to share uh, my private conversation with uh, prof uh, Professor Gorbis, who now is uh, teaching at the Chicago University. He used to be the chairman of uh, President Economic Council, uh, I guess a couple of years ago in the meeting uh, in Beijing. I asked him, I say, I just tra have checked back from US. I'm wondering whether you don't do any high a speed train from New York to Boston to Washington, D.C. Each side take four hours, but in China, maybe one or two hours. Why you don't do that? He's, he said to me, the problem is very hard negotiating the price of land. He said, we cannot spend quite enough time, money to get a land. Also, current track is not very straight. So high speed cannot use existing track. That's the problem. So even Trump say he want to make a one trillion investment. I finally, I, I thought he can really finish. That gives me the opportunity to say that a French company just for, won a huge contract, Alstom, for high-speed trains between Boston and New York, so mm. this uh, should improve <laughs> considerably in the, in the near future. Yeah. But re regarding investment, as you're saying, okay, it's sometimes difficult to negotiate, to have the time for the space to learn, but to make it efficient, uh, China has invested considerably 
and yet your growth is really slowing down. You also have a long-term vision. You invest in infrastructure, the Silk Road is really something long-term for the whole region, and yet we see the pace of growth slowing down. So is there something you're not doing right? Uh, I don't think so, because that's the, I call, development dilemma. On the one hand, along with the rapid uh, economic growth, at the same time, you create, you raise the cost of labor cost, of land cost, which will uh, reduce your growth rate. Mm -hmm. So that's nature will happen. You cannot always grow two digit. So in this uh, case, I think it's nature. Now, the growth rate uh, of Chinese economy around 6.5%, uh, which is still very high relative to other countries. Mm. Even down the road, maybe we'll go down to, in next two or three years, we we'll go down between five to six uh, percent annual growth rate, which is not bad mm. in some way. Of course, slowing down of Chinese economy do have some impact on a, a global economy, right. uh, which is varies uh, with different uh, country. Uh, if you are low material export, Exporting country, yes, the slowing down of Chinese economy have negative impact on this country. But at the same time, the domestic uh, the market expanded rapidly, which will provide more opportunity for foreign investor, for foreign uh, service. Also, China now in the stage, uh, the overseas direct investment uh, goes faster which will create more job, more opportunity for other countries. Mm. Uh, Mr. Park, you wanted to react, and after that, Mr. Trichet. Yeah, I think one of the reasons uh, Chinese economy growth is slowing down is because of the world economic recession. I mean, China used to be a world factory mm. to supply everything, but uh, because of world recession, China is slowing down in, uh, their, their exports. And now Chinese government uh, is changing uh, its policy focus on more domestic market consumption and also inland economic development. And through that, uh, China want to maintain growth rate of uh, 6.5, which is, as a professor says, that is very high. So what I'm saying is here, uh, Korea, for example, our export to China is decreasing mm -hmm. uh, rapidly. This year, during the last nine months, uh, our export to China decreased by 10%. The reason is this, uh, many Korean companies operating in China, they are doing the same thing as Chinese companies, na namely assembling things and mm -hmm. export to the, to the, to the uh, world market rather than supply to the uh, Chinese domestic market. Mm -hmm. So our parent company, most of the parent company exporting to their subsidiaries, parts and components for that, you know, the assembly uh, for mm -hmm. of, you know, final good and export to the outside. So I, I think uh, right now, Korean companies are adjusting their own strategy uh, also. In other words, they, are, they want to exploit 6.5% growth of China, yeah. of domestic market and inland de development, which would you know, provide huge opportunity for neighboring countries. Mm -hmm. So in that context, I think uh, free trade regime is much more important. I mean, US is investing a lot of money on infrastructure. Mm -hmm. How can they supply all the materials? We have to import from outside. That in, through that kind of activities, you have a positive impact on the world economy. But if you close your door, then you cannot have a, a positive impact on the world economy. That's what I want to say. No, what was just said is very important, of course, because we see precisely how the development of, uh, of uh, the Chinese economy itself makes that they produce things that were produced in Korea and imported in China, and now, of course, with the same subsidiary of the Korean uh, firms, uh, you have, you know, the, you know, the entrants uh, that are coming from, uh, from uh, Chinese production. So, so we see a good reason for global trade to diminishing a little bit. Uh, uh, <laughs> there are very bad reasons, and there are some reasons that can be explained. No, but I would like to go back to China because we have also to understand that China has now more or less the same restructuring problem that we had ourselves uh, dozens of years ago. Uh, the restructuring of uh, the steel industry, for instance, is absolutely 
incredibly large and it creates problems of uh, very, very big magnitude and are necessary because, because, again, China has now a level of a development which makes that it is no more appropriate to, to be uh, that big and large a producer of, of steel. And it is true for many other production where the value added uh, of uh, the Chinese production is going up and up and up and uh, as is the case in any uh, economies that is transforming itself into an advanced economy and this is clearly the case uh, in China in many domains. So I, I trust that uh, we can explain pretty easily if you take into account those necessary restructuring, uh, um, slowing down of uh, the growth in China and uh, maybe we will see that it is even difficult in my opinion to reach the goal of uh, 6.5 or something like seven uh, in the years to come because precisely the impact, the drag on the economy of the necessary restructuring of the state-owned enterprise of uh, steel production and mass production in many domain uh, will, uh, will be very, very difficult obviously. To, to reach today and tomorrow if I may, during the next two or three years, to reach 6.5 or seven means that the service sector must literally explode, which of course would be good, but may be difficult to reach. Do you agree with this, uh, Mr. Lipsky, and then maybe Mr. Chow? Yeah, I just wanted to add, uh, before we heard about China, that uh, IMF figures uh, in the latest uh, World Economic Outlook uh, note that the growth in capital spending or investment in China as a percent of GDP is dramatically higher than virtually any other economy. And yet the latest figures show growth in labor productivity in China is essentially about equal to the average in emerging markets. So at this moment, huge amounts of investment with relatively modest growth in productivity. And I assume that the restructuring uh, would aim at uh, increasing the efficiency of capital spending. Would you like to comment, Mr. Chow, on the fact that the Chinese economy w is going to have to change, too? Uh, I agree uh, with both of the, uh, what you say. Uh, yes, not only um, uh, the capital formation uh, coming down, particularly the investment from private uh, enterprise dramatically uh, decreased due to many reasons. Uh, I guess major reason is for private companies, they don't see a uh, great opportunity now in China. So they have been reluctant to uh, make more uh, investment in, uh, in, in capital uh, formation. Um, I guess the Chinese government now is, the, what they're taking is still encourage uh, public investment in infrastructure because China is still in the stage of uh, urbanization. Uh, the people living in the city in China, only a little bit more than uh, 50%, also due to special system we call hukou system. Even they work living in the city, some of them uh, originally uh, immigrant from countryside cannot totally enjoy the benefits of uh, originally a resident of city. So that's the part of uh, Chinese government should carry the, the reform. The dilemma Chinese government is facing, more and more people still want to move to large city rather than small city because the large city will provide a good opportunity of job. So that way will push up to the, the pr price of house. Mm -hmm. So that's the uh, difficulty a Chinese government try to, to, to resolve. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes, yeah, sure, Mr. Bart. Well, uh, China, uh, the government is trying to uh, improve their service sector because their service sector productivities are very low. So uh, they make a lot of commitment to gradually open up the uh, service sector to foreign, foreign companies or foreign services. But um, this is a little bit technical, but uh, in Geneva, uh, 20 some countries are negotiating for trading services agreement. Uh, major countries are all participating. 
but China is not participating because uh, uh, you know, I, I, I thought the U.S. is blocking the Chinese participation. I think, uh, you know, and Chinese government want to show its willingness to participate also. I think uh, the major countries like uh, EU and uh, United States, uh, Japan should consider seriously to invite uh, China into these negotiations because it's, it's in line with their own government policies. Mr. Chow, do you think it would be a good idea for the Chinese to join those discussions in Geneva? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Uh, if we turn to Europe now, we have a different situation. It's been a, a trying year. Uh, the Brexit was really a big surprise and, a, and a created a lot of new uh, uncertainties. Uh, the level of, of growth is not very high in Europe, especially in, in uh, countries like France. Um, we just had the Commission re reviewing the budgets of every state of the European Union, and they're giving us a little leeway to do some stimulus. Um, and it's very much asked by all the central banks because the central banks have been really, especially the ECB, has been really doing a lot to, to, to help the economy grow, but uh, it's not sufficient. Do you think that uh, maybe you or Monsieur Trichet, uh, that uh, the governments now have enough um, will and, and, uh, and power to in a substantive way the, the boost of economies in Europe given the political you know, context which is more difficult today? Well, I, I have to say that uh, I am a little bit uneasy with the uh, presentation that uh, there is now a single recommendation for all countries uh, in Europe, which is more or less the way the message of the Commission or the message of, uh, of uh, authorities is conveyed. But uh, it, there is absolutely, uh, uh, I would say, a need for uh, uh, activation of the domestic economy in Europe. That's clear. We are posting now something like 3% uh, current account surplus at the level of the euro area as a whole. Uh, I would be very satisfied with a zero, uh, with a balance uh, current account uh, uh, in the present uh, circumstances where we have uh, clearly a need for, um, for uh, growth and jobs and certainly uh, domestic uh, economy slacks uh, that, that are obvious. But that being said, it doesn't mean that all countries might embark on uh, new public spendings and new deficit. Uh, it is true for Germany, true probably for the Netherlands, perhaps true for one or two other countries. For the other country, I would say structural reforms are of the essence and uh, they have to be very prudent because uh, I have the memory of what happened in uh, 10 and 11 and 12, which was totally dramatic with a loss of credibility, a loss of creditworthiness, calling for extraordinary difficult measures, both, I would say, from the central bank, and I have the memory of purchasing treasuries of uh, Greece, Portugal, Ireland in 10, purchasing treasuries of uh, uh, Spain and Italy in 11, which were very, very difficult decisions to take, uh, very, uh, I would say, bold, uh, undoubtedly, very swift, because it had to be taken in a very short span of time with the uh, drama which was unfolding, and calling for uh, dramatic changes in the macro policies of the countries concerned. What we uh, are uh, characterizing as austerity in Europe was austerity on uh, part of Europe, on the countries that were in major difficulty, and it was uh, necessary to, be, uh, to embark on uh, appropriate uh, new measures to regain credibility and to regain competitiveness. I would say in, my, in the case of my own country, I don't think that augmenting public spendings when you are already uh, spending something like 57% or 57.5% of your GDP in public spendings, it's not good to augment. What is very good is to rebalance, to reshape the public spendings in order to have much more uh, growth and much more job creation. But to augment it or to augment the deficit would not be appropriate, neither for uh, Spain, nor for Italy, nor for Portugal, that's clear. So uh, again, I think we have to understand that it is true in Europe, 
you have different countries, different situations. Germany is not in the situation of Italy. So you should have recommendations that are not alike. You have countries that are extremely competitive and countries that are not competitive, countries that have a very good cost competitiveness, countries that have a bad cost competitiveness. The job of the Commission is precisely to adapt the recommendation to each country. It is exactly what the Stability and Growth Pact uh, is supposed to do, and it is exactly what the macroeconomic imbalance procedure, which is a new pillar to monitor uh, competitiveness, is supposed to do too. Uh, we have to understand that very, very, uh, and, but it's true also at the global level, in my opinion. I don't know what John thinks of that, but it seems to me that you cannot say at the global level the new motto is, I don't know, spend, 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 and uh, embark on deficit. Uh, no, uh, you have to adapt that to the various countries' concerns. <laughs> Thank you for that. Would you, do you agree, though, that Germany should do more for the rest of Europe, considering all its surpluses? Yes, indeed. Uh, G Germany has a current account surplus, which is around 8.5% of the GDP to 9. Uh, Germany behaved extremely properly since the setting up of the euro. Uh, the uh, macro policies and the structural policies were uh, undoubtedly good. The success is there, full employment is there, and uh, it is the main goal. Uh, the main goal of any economy in the advanced economy, but also, I trust, in the emerging economy, is to have full employment and uh, not, not let the country or the economy in a situation of mass unemployment. So Germany did very well. But the normal functioning of a market economy, when you are posting such uh, enormous surplus of savings, su such enormous surplus of profits of the companies, and such enormous uh, current account surplus, normally it should activate uh, domestic demand, both through investment, as uh, uh, John said, and also, of course, uh, with wages and salaries which would be more dynamic. Uh, I have to say that the uh, rhetoric of the government of Germany has changed quite considerably because they have encouraged uh, more dynamism for, uh, for wages and salaries. They have encouraged minimum uh, wages, which, is, which was new in Germany and is certainly a signal which is very important. And they have said uh, that they would diminish uh, taxation. So uh, part of the uh, room for maneuvering will be utilized. I expect that... Uh, uh, wages and salaries will augment much more dynamically. Uh, that investment will also be more dynamic in Germany, where you have also a need for uh, infrastructure investment in particular, and that we will see uh, a, a diminishing of this current account surplus, which would be good for Germany, in my opinion, and of course good for Europe as a whole. Uh, very good for Europe as a whole, obviously. Uh, Mr. Lipsky. Uh, of course, I, I agree with uh, what Jean-Claude just, has just said and would uh, uh, just reflect, of course, the current account surplus is a reflection of the excess of savings over investment. And when we look at what is, what is unusual, it's not the level of savings, it's the very low level of investment. And so the question has to be asked, what is standing in the way of, of investment? And I suspect if you spoke with a lot of uh, 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 corporate uh, executives of the principal uh, corporations in many Eurozone economies, they would tell you we're investing plenty, just not here, because the opportunities are better elsewhere. The, uh, so the question has to be asked, well, what are the barriers within the Eurozone? And certainly one has to be, it's uh, just to emphasize uh, uh, in practical terms what Jean-Claude said, structural reforms, meaning the uh, perfection or in increasing the openness of markets, and the flexibility of markets, both labor and product, but also an aspect that has to be addressed, which is the bank-based Eurozone financial sector uh, is not as healthy uh, as it needs to be to support that growth. And we can see that in the dramatic fall in bank stock, uh, Eurozone uh, bank stocks so far this year, and that many of the European banks are not investable at this time. And uh, as a result, it's clear there's more work to be done on both these, these aspects to improve the outlook within the Eurozone.
Yeah, about this, one of the big worries today is on Italian banks and the Italian banking system. And we always have a black sheep in Europe, used to be so Spain, Portugal, uh, Greece. Now, now the, the worries are geared toward Italy. Um, Monsieur Trichet, what is your assessment of that? Is there a systemic risk coming from Italian banks? Well, uh, uh, f first of all, uh, we have to replace the issue of the European banks uh, within the larger context. When you look at the financing of the U.S. economy, you have, uh, you had before the crisis, because it changed a little bit, but you had before the crisis, 25% uh, of the financing of the U.S. economy through banks only, and 75% uh, through market. It was exactly the contrary in Europe where uh, the banks were playing a decisive role in the financing of the economy. Uh, we had the crisis. We, of course, in the crisis, for us, the problem was to maintain the liquidity of the banks and to maintain the financing of our economy. But uh, the effort that we had to make on our own banks as a proportion of the economy was three times the efforts that the U.S. had to make on its own bank because simply of the size of the banks in Europe and in the US and the, uh, I would say, proportion of financing that they, they had to uh, organize. So uh, again, we have to understand that it is not abnormal, unfortunately, that the problem of the banks in Europe is larger than the problem of the banks in the US. And very often uh, we are uh, heavily criticized in Europe uh, with the argument, uh, you you didn't did uh, you didn't do uh, what was necessary as early and uh, I would say aggressively as the United States. And my response is, we had not the same size uh, of a problem. Uh, and again, and uh, in the U.S., of course, the markets were uh, had their liquidity because the uh, government uh, took very very major decisions with uh, two institutions in particular. Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, which are uh, specialized uh, in uh, the uh, mortgages and could, uh, I would say, spare, save the banks from uh, having uh, risks that they, ta they take in Europe because there is not such a, a system. So all that being said, uh, of course, uh, it's extremely important that the uh, bank's uh, problem is uh, as, uh, as clean as possible in, in Europe. The banking union is a major reform which goes in this direction. And we have, as you know now, a supervision uh, authority which is, uh, uh, I would say, full speed acting. Uh, of course, because the system was terribly segmented and is still very largely segmented, we might have problems in some countries. Uh, we don't speak of the Spanish banks because the Spanish banks were restructured in time with the help of the European through uh, uh, help which was given to the uh, state of Spain. It was not the same in Italy and that's the reason why we are speaking quite a lot of the Italian bank. I think that, of course, the, the uh, system uh, has to be cleared in Italy where there is a special problem of NPL, non-performing loans and so forth. I have, you know, I'm sure that it will be done. I don't think that there is a lack of uh, capital to invest in those banks. I don't think that there, is, uh, there are problems that could not be solved. But it's true that it goes against decisions which were taken at the global level and at the Italian level, namely that for a bank's problem in the future, and we are now in, the fu in that future, uh, you should normally not uh, embark on uh, help from the state, but you should ask creditors to take their own losses. And it is what we call in the jargon bailing in. But that is good when you do not have a systemic problem, but that cannot be done if you have a systemic problem. And uh, in uh, many cases, we have systemic problems. So again, uh, I trust that we will have to find out the appropriate ways with the help of the Italian government, with the help of the Commission, with the help of the other countries, uh, to adapt to a circumstance where you have to understand that uh, probably some help of the state 
is still necessary, even if the, the ultimate goal is that the taxpayer should always be being protected from banking problems in the future. After the 2008 crisis, uh, a lot of reforms were set up uh, at the governance level in the world. Um, do you think some years later that we are more protected uh, against systemic risk? Uh, have all the reforms been uh, achieved or is there still more to do? And also, uh, if you take into consideration the balance sheet of central banks today who were, you know, or firemen who came in, I mean, they're bloated, overloaded, and maybe they don't have that much uh, uh, oil left or fuel left to, you know, to help out if another crisis comes along. So could you, each of us, assess today if you feel more comfortable in the way um, the world governance has acted to, to prevent big crisis like we had in 2008? Or do you think there's still more to do? Whoever, maybe, Monsieur, you stand ready? To speak. You stand ready? Either, yeah. either well, first go or, ahead. or as, as the last one. <laughs> Uh, uh, Mr. Bart? Well, I'm not an expert on this subject, but uh, in the case of Korea, we are much more prepared for this kind of uh, crisis, not because of 2008 global financial crisis, but uh, because of the 1997 and 8 uh, uh, East Asian financial crisis. So I think corporations and financial institutions and even central bank are much more prepared you know, to deal with this kind of thing. But one thing which was very interesting is that um, you know, IMF uh, gave us a very stringent uh, recommendation in 1997. In other words, uh, we have a financial crisis. IMF recommended that uh, we should do more tight monetary policy, having high interest rate, and uh, you know, government should, uh, should not spend more money, you know, but in 2008, exactly opposite kind of policy recommendation, low interest rate, print of money, and uh, stimulate the you know, economy by using government expenditures. But in any You're case- a little uh, sore here. <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, uh, you know, at the time, a lot of innocent small companies, healthy companies collapsed because of high interest rate. IMF quickly adjusted you know, uh, in having low uh, interest rate right away. But in any case, you know, we are much more prepared uh, we are suffering from world recession, not because, not the systemic, systemic uh, kind of crisis in Korea. Mr. Lipsky? Sure, there, there are a number of things to say. I, I don't have to feel defensive about that period. I was not in the IMF. <laughs> <laughs> and in, in fact, was uh, perhaps a, a little critical of, of some of the actions of the fund at that time. But in fact, uh, two things to say about the, about the, about the Asian crisis, or three. Uh, one, it's uh, so little recognized, the IMF had at that time no instruments available to it that could serve usefully as crisis prevention instruments, but only crisis resolution instruments. It did not have the tools. Secondly, uh, part of the uh, problem of the, the uh, seemingly inappropriate initial diagnosis was the ba on the basis of a consensus view that the downturn was going to be quite mild. And when it became evident that the downturn was actually severe, the, all, the, all the policy advice was recast. And we should, so we shouldn't miss the point. In 1996, fastest growing region of the world was uh, Asia. 1997, recession. 1998, recession, and talk about structural feet of clay 1999, fastest growing area of the world, Asia. So something, something went right. Now, the, are we still susceptible to the kind of crisis then or 2008, 2009? I hope the answer is no. Uh, the the um, principal institutional response to, the, to the, great, the global financial crisis was the creation of the G20 Leaders Summit process and the creation of four principal goals of the, of the G20. Uh, first, to restore global growth. Secondly, to uh, repair and re reform the financial system. Third, to prevent protectionism, trade protectionism, protectionism and promote new trade liberalization. And fourth, reform, reform the international financial institutions. 
on the one hand, and, and in each case, there was a clear assignment of duties, if you will. For growth, they created the framework for strong, sustainable, and balanced growth, which was a new process of cooperative setting of macroeconomic policy. Secondly, they created the FSB, the Financial Stability Board, to uh, reform uh, the financial system, enhance systemic stability, and create a level playing field. Uh, for trade, they focused on the adoption of the Doha, the completion of the Doha Development Round, and fourth, uh, I am essentially IMF reform. All of those remain either unattained or incomplete at this time. And the commitment of the, of the principal G20 countries to that cooperative framework process of macroeconomic policy setting seems to have been, I would say, a big disappointment. However, uh, be that as it may, I think you'd have to say that in the financial, the risks of uh, financial instability have been reduced by the actions uh, of the FSB, increase in capital, certainly there are still risks, but I think we're in, in better shape than we were before, and, and the G20 framework exists, at least it's there clicking over, if you will, in case uh, there's a need for larger scale collective action. The one final uh, uh, point I would make in this context, the IMF still lacks sufficient crisis prevention instruments to be able to work effectively and uh, as effectively as it should and needs to. I fully agree uh, with what uh, John said. Based on what he described, the, the progress we have all uh, achieved after the outbreak of uh, global financial crisis, we still have a long way to go to uh, totally uh, uh, exclude the possibility of uh, financial crisis occur. But we do um, uh, achieve some, uh, some degree uh, of progress. Uh, for example, I can mention uh, after the uh, fi uh, global financial crisis, we have a new concept occur. We call global financial asset network. Uh, people recognize only if you only account one level, uh, whatever institution or resource, it is not enough to prevent occurrence of uh, financial crisis. So currently, Global financial asset network includes uh, four components. First of all, self-insurance. You have to, for developing countries, you have to have some kind of foreign reserve. Second is a currency swap. Uh, if something happens, uh, you can do something, uh, currency swap. I guess case in, 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 in South Korea, I guess finally uh, U.S. have a currency swap. Uh, with your country, in, so finally, uh, give you a lot of help. Third one is a regional uh, financial arrangement, like the Qingmei Initiative, like the ESM. At the top, of course, IMF. So leader of G20 uh, recognize IMF should play more important role. Uh, I guess uh, in uh, on. March 31, in the conference in, in Paris, uh, Madame Lagarde, in the lunch speech, I, I'm very impressive. He, she said, IMF should take a more positive role to have kind of arrangement with the regional uh, financial arrangement. I, I was taught uh, they have already jointly, IMF with the Qingmei Initiative, jointly to do some exercises uh, to prepare uh, assuming some case, uh, crisis case happen, how they can do jointly. That kind of things, I guess, is, uh, have been positive. We should uh, continue to carry these kind of things. So to, to, to respond to, to your question, first of all, I would agree with all what has been said by the panelists. Uh, uh, we, we proved that we were able at a global level to uh, embark on a crisis resolution uh, quite well, obviously, because we were threatened by a depression of the type of 29, 30s uh, in the 20th century. That was clearly what was threatening uh, 
the advanced economy and by way of consequence the global economy. It was a terrible threat and uh, we could by a combination of bold and swift measures, by the combination of uh, institutional arrangement and the creation of the G20 at the level of heads of state and government was something which was really decisive, I trust, in the heat of the crisis. Uh, and I ask you to note that it is something of extreme importance because the informal cooperation, governance, of the global economy was given to the G20, namely to all systemic uh, emerging economies also, and not only to the advanced economy, which was the case before. The G7 passed the baton, if I may, to the G20. And the G20 did a very good job, in my opinion, in the crisis, uh, avoiding, again, uh, a great depression, uh, along the four dimensions which have been mentioned. But I have to say that uh, uh, I agree very much with what was said on the fact that uh, we are exactly at the middle of the road. Uh, we did not really, uh, uh, and I cannot myself say, uh, we have all the elements which permit us to guarantee that we will not have a new crisis of the size of that uh, crisis we had. When I look at a number of uh, indicators, I see that in particular, we have an augmentation of leverage at, a, at the global level. Uh, you know, part of the uh, crisis came out of the piling up of debt, public and private. And then we had the explosion of uh, 2007, 2008. Uh, but now we are in a situation in terms of pure leverage, namely uh, debt outstanding as a proportion of GDP, which is higher. So uh, from that standpoint, I think we have no reason for being complacent in any respect. And uh, I have also to say that uh, uh, there are other elements where we can say we didn't do the job yet. Uh, all what is the non-banks, the shadow banking, has not been touched uh, until now in a way which would be very convincing. The banks, yes. On, on the uh, bank, banking institution, and I have to say also on the insurance uh, company, one can say that uh, the new prudentials are there and, and they are quite, uh, quite important. So again, I would say we are at the middle of the road. Of course, in terms of, uh, of uh, trade, uh, we are back paddling, and we already addressed this. But it was one of the four dimensions that was reaffirmed by the entire international community, emerging countries as well as advanced economy in the time of the crisis. And uh, that is one of the reasons why we, we have to, to be very cautious and prudent on the consequences on the global economy of the new move on, on trade, which we already discussed. As regards, because your question was also on the side of the central banks. As regards the central banks, I would say that uh, they uh, were um, extremely bold obviously, and, and SWIFT also. Uh, a lot of decisions were taken extremely rapidly and uh, are uh, still you know, considered today as uh, necessary, which, uh, by the way, means that we still have big problems in the advanced economy. We are, we are not uh, out of the wood uh, fr from that standpoint. Uh, but, of course, uh, the message of the central banks to the other partners is very, very clear, and it is the same in Japan or uh, in Europe or in the US in the advanced economy. It is, uh, we cannot be the only game in town. You have to step in, you governments, you parliaments, you uh, private sector and social partners. We are doing a lot, but if what we are doing in Japan, in Europe, in the US is only to permit the other partners not to do their job, then we are only paving the way for the next crisis. And uh, the kind of job which uh, should be done, of course, is structural reforms in all countries. There is not a single country where you could say uh, the, the job is done from that uh, standpoint. And again, these are also different messages. You can tell some countries you have room for maneuvering, you should embark on the appropriate uh, activation 
of your economy through perhaps public finance deficit, more public finance uh, spending and so forth. That, that would be correct in some countries, not in all. And I am very, very afraid of the fact that the interpretation of the message of the central bank could be, yes, indeed, we have to embark into generalized loose fiscal policies, for instance, would be a, a major mistake because we have already extremely loose uh, monetary policy. We did not just, I think my neighbor was right in saying that uh, in the Latin America crisis, in the African and Middle East crisis, uh, I'm, I'm speaking of the sovereign crisis of the year 80s and 90s, in the Asian crisis, we were asking the countries concerned to adjust and adjustment was not easy. In this crisis, we asked only the countries that had a major, major loss of creditworthiness to adjust, namely the euro area countries, the five euro area countries that had difficulty, not the other, and certainly not the other advanced economy. In my opinion, uh, it is the, the, the right and proper, I would say, attitude should be in between. Vis-a-vis -vis the advanced economy, we have been in this present crisis extremely gentle and kind. I'm speaking of the uh, international institution as a whole. Of course, the advanced economy being called to adjust dramatically would have you know, triggered the entire world to be in a dramatic situation. So there are some reasons why the international community was more kind and gracious with the advanced economy than it was for the emerging economies in the 80s and 90s. Still, I think we have to reflect on that. It's, it go, doesn't go without saying that you tell Asian countries you have to adjust in the sharpest and abruptest way at the end of the 90s, and it, was, it doesn't go without saying that you have to say to the advanced economy, please have the most accommodating policies possible because uh, you know, it's necessary in this situation. The, re the, the right and proper message or recommendation should perhaps be a little bit in between. And uh, as I said, uh, we did not adjust at a global level and at the level of the advanced economy since the crisis, leverage is augmenting when you, you take the simplest indicator of leverage that you could take, and that is not reassuring. Thank you for this long explanation. I see a little bit of your German side here when you don't want us to spend too much. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left, so if there are any questions uh, in the room, uh, uh, please raise your hands. I, I do see some questions. If somebody could pass around with a mic, that would be very helpful. The mic is coming. Um, there's one person here. I see there was one in the front too, please. Thank you very much. So, uh, as mentioned already, you mentioned, the speakers here mentioned that uh, the U.S. is, like there, is, there can't be a, even a partial isolation for the U.S. Uh, economic in this in the world so if the Trump administration as a as he like predicted or as he mentioned in his campaign go ahead and eliminate the TPP the NAFTA agreement and the other agreements that he mentioned that he would eliminate uh, how could that affect the economic uh, as a challenge in the whole world and how could the other countries take advantage of that, and who exactly could take advantage of il the elimination of uh, this agreement? And could there be an alternative? As we know, like there can't be an elimination, there can't be an isolation for the uh, United States uh, as a part in uh, the world economical uh, stage or society. So, what could be an uh, alternative? And could the United States as well propose another agreement with its term, and could it be accepted, especially by China? As you mentioned here, uh, it's already dropping below, the, the, its growth is dropping below 6.5. Uh, 
percent and uh, how could it actually accept or deny the new agreement, especially with the TPP and the other agreements? Thank you very much. Well, I will respond to the part of your questions. Uh, I think uh, uh, Trump government will uh, abandon TPP and maybe dramatically change the NAFTA. Uh, what will be the impact? I think for TPP, simply you are losing so-called potential gain you can earn from the TPP because you are not implementing it. So it's not that much, you know, damage. But NAFTA, I think uh, Mexico will be, if they abandon uh, NAFTA or renegotiate NAFTA, then maybe Mexico will be uh, tremendously hurt. But Mexico doesn't mean Mexico alone. All the you know, multi multinational companies who are operating in, including US companies operating in Mexico, will have a hard time uh, by you know, the high tariffs or whatever. So, uh, I think it is, it is damaging uh, if they, uh, Trump uh, uh, pursue actually and implement this kind of uh, new policies. But I want to say just one thing, alternative uh, for this kind of environment is that uh, it's about time for all the leaders to seriously consider to save the multilateral trading system. It may not, uh, uh, they cannot do it immediately, but we should open the another track for multilateral trade negotiations. Nobody pay attention to multilateral trade negotiations, especially the Doha round. So I want to emphasize that you know, we have to go back to the basics, which is multilateral trade negotiations. And secondly, many uh, news media and trade experts are saying, maybe because of, you know, the, because the uh, uh, US is reverting back to the protectionist, protectionism at all levels, maybe China can lead the, the, the trade integration or world trading system. It makes sense, but uh, it also requires very strong leadership from China to uh, open up more, especially in the RCEP negotiations. It is not making any progress. I think we need a very strong leadership, which is different from the past, because we are entering into new, new kind of environments. I, I also hope that uh, China should show some leadership in the RCEP negotiations. Yes, just a question for the panel. I was struck that in this session on the main issues facing the world economy, none of you uh, raised the issue of the impact of adjusting to lower oil prices, lower commodity prices. It's obviously a big issue for the region, but do you think that from a global point of view, whatever cost there was of this adjustment has now been borne, and going forward, this is no longer a major issue? Yeah, Mr. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, I would say, uh, panel had to address uh, all, all possible questions. I don't think you should interpret that on the fact that we consider the price of oil and commodity as a very, very meager problem. It's, it's a major, major issue. And uh, uh, from my standpoint, I would say not only a major issue because uh, if, if the price is too volatile, too erratic. It creates a lot of uncertainties, uh, uncertainties in terms of investment, in particular, as John said. It also uh, is an explanation of uh, the lack of investment the world over in the present period, because I don't see any real investment now at the present level of oil in this domain, and it is part of the, of the global problem. But seen, uh, I would say, uh, from the uh, central bank standpoint, it's absolutely clear that part of our problem, namely very low inflation, uh, desperately low inflation, and by way of consequence, very low interest rates and nominal interest rates and so forth, comes also out of the abnormally low price of oil and commodity. Uh, and uh, uh, we were expecting that the price of oil and commodity, and oil in particular, would remain at the somewhat higher level that it had attained in the past, and then that we could progressively eliminate in the CPI, in the measure of inflation, the impact of the very low price. But unfortunately, it appears that uh, it is not the case. And I would say uh, 
it has a lot of consequences, not only on the real economy, not only on the systemic stability of the world, but also seen from the central bank perspective in terms of maintaining this very abnormal situation of very low inflation rate. Just, just to say very quickly, mm -hmm. uh, of course, the, uh, pri especially energy prices have been very much affected by, by technology. It was only a few years ago that folks were talking about peak oil, and of course, uh, things change very dramatically. So I'm looking forward to the subsequent presentation on the hydrocarbon market to give us some insight as to where things might be going. Uh, John Lipsky uh, pointed out uh, uh, that one of the problem was a low level of investment and as a consequence a low level of uh, productivity increase. And I think he said it was not clear why we had that situation. And I was wondering, uh, don't you think that uh, the behavior of the financial markets of, and of investors is one of the reasons for that low investment? Because for listed companies, except for high-tech, high-tech companies can walk on water. Uh, but for other companies, uh, investors are more asking for dividends and share buybacks that for any entrepreneurial behavior or any risk-taking investment. And if this is the case, what can we do to change that behavior? Yes, for sure. Uh, well, I think I said there's no, si there's no single simple explanation. And there have been some factors recently that should have been favorable. Decline in energy prices for investment in the non-oil sector, very historically low real interest rates, uh, relatively, especially in places like the U.S., very high, uh, record high corporate profit share of GDP, high corporate liquidity, etc. <clears throat> but I think uh, when you're looking for explanations, among other things, the lingering uncertainty from, uh, from the crisis. Uh, secondly, the aging of populations may have uh, affected investors' preference for uh, safe assets over, over risk-taking. And the, as you point out, the financial sector, I think, is, is part of the problem. So uh, no, no simple single answer, uh, but let me tie it for a final statement to the theme of this conference, which is global governance. And uh, I would say uh, the, the G20, as we've been talking about, the G20 actually produced uh, a very good result in a moment of, of crisis. Uh, collective action, effective collect collective action. Uh, since that time, I think we've seen a drift away from that commitment to coherent and cooperative action, especially at the level of macroeconomic policy. And I think that has, uh, had his, undermined or at least not helped boost the kind of uh, confidence that would be necessary for strengthening, uh, strengthening uh, among other things, investment. I would also just like to say, I think we're going to get a new test coming in the immediate future of the resilience of global, go global government governance because we're moving into, clearly we're about to move into a new era in which there's perceived divergence of policy plans and policy focus that could tend to further undermine uncertainty if not well controlled. We're going to have the Fed raising interest rates in a context in which there's markets are beginning to suspect that the U.S. could be moving to more expansionary policies in a context in which uh, the, others, the, the ECB has remained very uh, committed to its, uh, its loose policies, Bank of Japan has committed to new uh, easing. Uh, China has uh, eased its credit policies. This is going to be potentially a real test. So that will be the final. Thank you very much all for listening and thank you for your insights this morning.